welcome, Mike. Uh, I've been looking forward to interviewing Mike Posner today about his career and his life. He's someone I admire and I consider a friend. Mike earned his BA degree at University of Washington uh, in physics uh, in 57. He also received his master's degree there. Then he moved to the University of Michigan where he uh, completed his PhD. After a brief tenure at the University of Wisconsin, he moved to Oregon where he became a professor in the Department of Psychology and he stayed there for the rest of his career until now, except for two brief uh, leaves of absence. He's also the founding director of the Sackler Institute for Developmental Psychobiology at the Weill Medical School of Cornell University. Mike's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the first winner of the uh, Graham Meyer Award in Psychology. In recognition of his nearly 50 years of groundbreaking psychological research, methodological breakthroughs, and theoretical insights, Mike was awarded the National Merit of Science in 2008 by President Obama. Best known for his seminal work in the area of attention, Mike introduced techniques and concepts that proved foundational to all of cognitive psychological science. In addition, he's made major contributions to developmental and educational psychology, as well as to neuroscience and psychobiology. Mike's an icon in the field. I got to know Mike initially through my close my good friend, Mary Rothbard, who is Mike's longtime collaborator and very close friend. Then Mike and I ended up getting summer places almost the same time on the Oregon coast, about 10 miles away. So my husband and I got to know him and his wife, Sharon, much better than we had previously. In addition, a little while after Mike started hanging out on the coast, I submitted a grant that had candidate genes, and I asked Mike provided me, well, served as a consultant, and provided me with very valuable information and ideas about alleles to use. And I know he's provided this kind of assistance and guidance to a number of other investigators and um, students who want to be researchers. One of Mike's uh, endearing qualities is that although he's so well known, he's very modest and unassuming and, and uh, unpretentious. He also has some interesting pursuits outside of psychology that I hope we get to talk about today. So Mike, why don't we get started with your telling me uh, us something about your family of origin and how they influenced your, your career path. Well, my father was born in Denver, Colorado. His father had migrated from what was sometimes Russia and sometimes Poland. But rather than settling in New York, where so many of the Jewish migrants went, he actually went to Denver and set up a shoe shop there. He also organized for the Socialist Labor Party at the time. And uh, my father uh, did uh, undergraduate work at the University of Denver and then moved to Cincinnati, Ohio, because the YMCA there had a night law school. And he, he, he wanted to go to law school and uh, did go and graduated and practiced law in Cincinnati for a number of years until I came along. Uh, actually, not because of me, but uh, they moved uh, west to California because of health problems. And he never practiced law again. He went into the social work area. When my mother. Uh, stayed at home most of the time, but she also was a very crackerjack shoe salesman. And uh, so uh, my brother was probably the most influential person. I think from our father, my brother and I both got pretty strong social values. He used uh, them in doing all the aspects of clinical medicine, which he's been involved with. And for me, it was more in the education field. My brother is a very well-known neurologist, one of the, perhaps one of the best-known neurologists in the world. He's the founder of the neuro-oncology program at uh, Memorial Hospital in New York. 
he's uh, stepped down from the headship of that department, but he still, even though he's 83, he still maintains uh, his active career. And he's given me a lot of advice during uh, my long time. And so he's probably been as influential as any member of the family could be. So how did you get into psychology? Because I, I know your undergraduate degree was in physics. Yes, uh, I always wanted to teach. That was my basic idea. And uh, I loved physics. It's a very romantic field. Uh, <laughs> the finding out the nature of the fundamental particles of the world is important. And, uh, but I wasn't really good enough in physics to ever teach it. And uh, so my brother said, well, try a biological science. Maybe it'll be a little easier for you. And uh, <laughs> I, I did try biophysics. I, I actually didn't do too well at that either. But uh, during the time I was in the military, I took a correspondence course from Yousafi uh, in psychology. It's the first time I had had psychology. It's an introductory course. And uh, it was actually graded by a professor at the University of Washington. And we got into some correspondence. And then when I came back from my army service, which was only six months at that time, I uh, decided, well, I'd get ready to do graduate work in psychology. And I took a job because of my physics background. I took a job with the human engineering group at Boeing Airplane Company. So I was working in the field. I was taking undergraduate courses to get ready to go to, to get a master's degree. And uh, at that time, it seems strange now, I don't think people could hardly believe this, but companies like Boeing were so anxious for people to get advanced degrees, because it helped them get military contracts, I guess, and uh, that they paid my way and also tolerated me working like four hours in the morning, going to school for four hours or eight hours, and then coming back and finishing my day. And uh, so uh, that's how I was able to get a master's degree in psychology. And then uh, when I decided to go on for my PhD, I was attracted to Michigan pr primarily because Paul Fitz, who was my, he turned out to be my advisor at Michigan, he was the biggest name in human engineering in the field. I'd read a lot of his papers, and so I decided if possible, I would go and work with him. So what was your graduate education like, and how did it shape your future direction? And what challenges were there? Well, there were two, two parts to my graduate education. There was my work at, at the University of Washington getting a master's degree. That was a little hectic because uh, I had to go and work full time at Boeing to get the money <laughs> to the master's degree. And so uh, although I took a lot of courses and did OK, in the courses, uh, I didn't really get the feeling that I was a graduate student, really a part of the research community, although we were doing research at Boeing and even published an article on the uh, then new 707's sound uh, uh, suppression system. Pretty interesting area of research. But then when I went to Michigan, I just loved Michigan. It was a wonderful place, a very large uh, department with many really brilliant graduate students and in all fields of psychology. And it was just an eye opener to me to go into the room, have lunch, and then uh, talk to who, whoever was working on some problem. And of course, it was an interesting time in psychology because the signal detection theory was being developed at uh, Oregon. There was the, what now would be called behavioral economics then was called kind of just human decision making. There was lots of fields of interest and uh, I really enjoyed my graduate education. It got terminated rather quickly. I only spent two years at Michigan. I was working on my doctoral dissertation when the Berlin Wall went up and uh, we got about a, a month's notice that we had to report for, medic uh, for military service. And, Anniston, Alabama, which was the home of the Chemical Corps. So <clears throat> I was in the midst of writing my thesis. I probably would have done more experiments because it was early in the year. But uh, I thought I probably had enough. 
You know, there was no xerography then. I photographed, oh, maybe, maybe 2,000 pages of literature and took them in long scrolls to my uh, military uh, service. And then the first couple months, we thought we were going to go to war in Berlin. Hard to believe, but that was, that was true. And then uh, uh, after that, it looked like that was never going to happen. And then I got time to sit with my scrolls of, <laughs> of paper and write my thesis. So how was it you started to study attention? And what were some of the methods you started using? Well, I, the primary influence was Donald Broadbent's 1958 book, Perception and Communication, which he raised the issue of attention and showed how it would be a, a crucial aspect of the information processing system. But um, my effort to study attention turned out to be a failure for the study of attention, a kind of interesting failure. I was getting the time to switch between the visual modality and the auditory modality by presenting one stimulus, a letter, in the visual modality and another stimulus, a letter, in the auditory modality. And when they were the same, like an A and a visual A, then you were to press one key and different another key. And lo and behold, it was much longer to do it when it was auditory visual than when it was visual visual. But as soon as I made the rule a little more complicated, like deciding whether it was a vowel or a consonant, the difference went away. And it really wasn't due to attention. It was due to the fact that if it's in one modality, it can be physically identical. And the processing of that information is quite different even when it's a high, than we, we even when it's a highly overlearned something like a capital A and a lowercase a. And uh, at the time, psychology was pretty much about the reinforcement history of the person, not about the structure of the nervous system. And I thought this increase in time to deal with you know, things which were upper and lower case maybe was a way of looking at the extra information processing that the brain had to do in order to get to the name level or at least to a higher order visual level. And uh, so that's, uh, that failed experiment uh, was my entry. And then I got on to the idea that I could use warning signals to trace a little of the processing that went on as the person went into an alert state. And about that time, uh, Gray Walter had discovered that you could, between a warning signal and a target, there was a negative drift in the EEG called the contingent negative variation. And I studied the relationship between reaction time and the contingent negative variation. And uh, eventually, this alerting work and other work uh, led to a paper which was called Components of Attention, which is, was my first real paper in the area of attention. Uh, how did you come to study patients with different kinds of lesions? Well, it was, uh, it was reading, really. I read a paper by Vernon Mountcastle, another one by Bob Wirtz, in which they had found what uh, Mountcastle called attention cells in the parietal lobe. And at the time, I was doing work on the shifts of visual attention. So if you were uh, at fixation uh, and you got a cue to attend to the right field without moving your eyes, but just covertly, you could move your attention over there. And if uh, there was no signal, you could even move your attention to another place. And uh, within a half a second, I had seemed to have trapped uh, two movements of attention. And I just was thinking, maybe this had something to do with these uh, tension cells that Mountcastle was talking about. And maybe it would be possible to couple behavioral results in reaction time with this cellular activity that was found in, in, in monkey work with cellular recording by Mount Castle and also by Bob Wirtz. And the trick there was to get patients with lesions of the parietal lobe, so these 
tension cells would be damaged and see if you could see about that as a, a deficit of attention. That's how I uh, began to study patients. I had the great good fortune that one of the world's really great behavioral neurologists moved to Portland from uh, Johns Hopkins University, Oscar Marin, and he asked me if I would set up a laboratory within Good Samaritan Hospital to study neuropsychology. And it was a wonderful experience. I, I commuted for seven years from Eugene once a week. We set up a laboratory. We had many postdocs, some of them very well-known people uh, who came to work there. And we studied patients. I particularly was interested in studying the components of neglect. And I made what was, I think, a very interesting discovery. That is, depending upon where the lesion was, you could get interference with disengaging attention from one, from the fixation to move to the cue. You could get interference with the movement time to move from one place to another. Or you could get interference with the re-engagement of attention at the new place. And uh, these were in different neural areas. And uh, this seemed to me to be a possible solution to the long problem of whether the brain worked as a whole or whether there was localization. I began to think there was localization, not of whole tasks, but of components of mental operations. And uh, that made it a very exciting time. We worked with a lot of other patient populations as well, because when you set up a neuropsychology lab, the neurologist wants you to see everyone. And so one of the challenges was to have a, find a psychological question related to that particular patient population. And I, I think we, we made really a number of important discoveries at that time. How long was that collaboration? Uh, seven years. Uh, it started in uh, 1979 when Oscar moved to Portland and it ended in 1985 when I had another opportunity to test uh, the idea that I had developed from the patients because in psychology it was very common to say that if it's a lesion patient you really can't say what it would be like in a normal non-lesion person. So I knew that no one would ever really buy my theoretical idea here unless I had some other way of uh, actually seeing whether these areas of the brain were carrying out the mental operations. Uh, of course, I was looking for an opportunity to test my hypothesis. Oh, I guess I had a hypothesis, actually. Uh, you, you admit it. <laughs> yes, I think I had one. And, uh, of course, I read a paper in Scientific American by a Swedish group, which was the actual start of neuroimaging uh, in the modern era. The neurologists would have people uh, listen to a Shakespeare play or maybe in one of the best experiments to find their way f mentally from one location to another and did a scan. They didn't really isolate mental operations. They studied whole tasks, sometimes very complicated ones. And I realized that was not the way to do, uh, to do a test of my hypothesis anyway, and maybe wasn't gonna, going to progress uh, neuroimaging very far. So I was looking for an opportunity. And uh, meanwhile, Washington University, which was one of the most creative is in developing various kinds of neuroimaging tools there, uh, wanted to recruit someone who studied the higher mental processes in a way which they thought was sufficiently scientific. And they were, they were a little fussy about who they got. They wanted a psychologist, but they uh, weren't sure exactly whether a psychologist would fit their idea of being sufficiently scientific. Uh, the leader there, Mark Rakel, was an extraordinary uh, scientific leader. And uh, so I interviewed there. I was a little reluctant to, to go back to St. Louis to live. So at first I, I didn't, wasn't really interested in taking the job. And I waited to see if someone else would take it. But actually, 
there wasn't really anyone interested in doing neuroimaging and psychology. Uh, we had a slogan, and it's the danger of a slogan. It's all about the software. The hardware does not matter. And uh, partly this came from uh, uh, Herbert Simon, didn't probably believe it, but the slogan was strong, and it was a slogan in cognitive psychology. So people, what difference would it make? Well, of course, since I had had the lesion work, uh, I knew it made a difference. And so I had eventually agreed to take a leave of absence from the University of Oregon, which I loved a lot, and uh, go to St. Louis to see if I could actually help the group solve a problem that couldn't be solved in neuroscience in any other way. And uh, we actually settled, I wanted to study attention. But when you talk to a neurologist and you say, look, I want to study attention, which seems to be a kind of a strange topic, and, but as long as you used eye movements, they could believe it. And then I said, no, I'm talking about covert shifts of attention, which you can't, you don't see, the eyes are fixed. And, but I'm not really that interested in the overall, I'm interested in the mental operations that are necessary to carry out that co Well, by then they'd be asleep. <laughs> uh, language was a lot more direct, plus you have to understand this was not m uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, it was positron emission tomography. And it is invasive, it uses radioactivity, and there had to be a really good medical reason for doing it, and there was for study of language. Because uh, it, it, in order, a, neuro, a neurosurgeon, in order to know where to operate, will perform something called a WADA test, in which they anesthetize each of the hemispheres. Well, it's a really invasive process in which there could be damage by when you thread up the catheter and knocking off a plaque and you know, causing a stroke. So, but for that, PET seemed to be a much less invasive uh, technology, and so we decided we would try to localize the mental operations in language in processing single words. And uh, it took a long time to do the experiments, a couple of years, but eventually we did do them, and they were really the first experiments in the kind of the modern uh, neuro, I mean, neuroimaging has a long history, of course, which Mark has traced out, but the modern kind of cognitive neuroscience tradition began with those experiments were published in 1988 in Nature and 1989 in Science. So how was your later work then influenced by modern imaging techniques and what did you find? In, well, in every way. Everything I've done since has been built on imaging. I haven't always done imaging, but everything has been built on the idea that we could localize mental operations. So uh, after I finished the experiments in St. Louis, even before we finished, we began to record from multiple electrodes in the scalp. The interesting thing is, of course, EEG had been done for a long time, but you can't infer from a scalp distribution the location of the generator. But in the opposite direction, you can go. If you know where the generator is from a PET or fMRI, now fMRI study, then you can predict the scalp distribution. And we followed out that idea to localize, to measure the time course of the various things involved in processing a visual or auditorily presented word, mostly visual. And so we were able to look at the time course of the visual word form system, of the phonology, of the semantics, and so on, and kind of look at transfer between various areas in terms of coupling of uh, EEG rhythms. So that, that work uh, really was closely related to the neuroimaging findings. And really everything I've done since then has been based on following out the consequences of imaging the brain. And of course, one of the criticisms of neuroimaging has been localization of function, that some people have thought that's its only role is to say where in the brain. But that hasn't turned out to be its only role. The methodology has grown a lot. And uh, new things have been uh, possible to do, tracing uh, white matter tracks, for example, and other things 
that allow very much closer relations between the psychological questions, cognitive theories, and the neuroimaging results. So how did you get interested in developmental processes? And I understand that was related to your decision to go to New York to set up the institute. Yes. My first uh, foray into developmental uh, was in 1980. Uh, I had an invitation to give a talk at the uh, Nebraska Symposium on motivation. Of course, I knew nothing about motivation at all. And uh, so I was able to talk to my colleague, Mary Rothbart, and we decided that most of the developmental psychologists were measuring attention by eye position. And that, I'm not saying it's a bad way to measure attention. You can measure. I mean, the eyes generally move to what you're interested in, of course. And that's been a, played a very big role in infant work. But I, I thought it was useful to point out that uh, there, it might be possible also to see the development of the underlying networks which were, which were related to eye movements but weren't, weren't the eye movements themselves. And so we, we did that. And then when I got back to St. Louis and we were able to measure the time course of mental operations, well, if you have a network of, of neural areas that are being activated in real time, especially if they're related to the field of attention, if they're attentional networks, you want to know where they came from. And that meant for a psychologist looking at infants. Of course, I knew, I mean, I had had two children, but... I didn't know exactly how to work with infants in the laboratory. Mary was an expert in this, and uh, she helped really uh, change into a really developmental work. Uh, and uh, we worked together and uh, did many experiments, particularly in uh, three months to about a few years in what would be infancy and transition to childhood. And then in uh, 1998, um, Weill Medical College, then Cornell Medical uh, College, but now Weill Medical College of Cornell University, uh, was uh, wanting to set up an institute due to a private uh, donation from the Sackler uh, family uh, that would deal with uh, aspects of development and I wanted to capture this institute for pediatric neuroimaging. And uh, so I wanted to go to New York and set up an institute, just like I had been in St. Louis on leave, to, uh, to be sure that it would take advantage of what was being done in imaging. And uh, uh, I, I went there in 1998. I recruited the world leader in pediatric neuroimaging, B.J. Casey. And I had, we had excellent postdocs who uh, themselves made outstanding contributions to the field. And uh, the institute, when I left in 2002, uh, they wisely decided to make B.J. Casey the head of the institute, and she's done a wonderful job there. It is one of the leading places in the world to study how the brain influences psychological development in normal people and in people who have various kinds of challenges. So how has the field of psychology changed during your tenure? <laughs> oh, it's been, a, it's been an amazing change. I mean, I, I got into psychology to teach, and it was just a lot harder discipline to teach because... Uh, even if localization of function isn't quite true, it is true that people can learn if you give them a concrete local place, if you can have a, a place where it occurs. So the link between cognition and the brain uh, has helped enormously in, in making this discipline uh, something that you can teach to students at, at all levels. And non-students too, uh, lay people are very interested in these things. And of course, 
I got into psychology, there wasn't even cognitive psychology at that time. I mean, we, we were interested in human information processing and human performance. But when Neisser's book uh, came out in 1968 with the name Cognitive Psychology, then that led to a very intense interest in thought processes and higher mental processes and so on. So there's been a transformation in the field uh, a lot. And uh, I, to me, it's been a very, uh, been a much better field than it was. Mm -hmm. So what do you see as the relation of psychology to social, cognitive, and affective neuroscience? Well, so psychology always had a lot of names. I mean, uh, I was, when I was trained, I was an experimental psychologist. That's what we were called. And then Nicer's book trained us, changed us into cognitive psychologists. And then uh, I did, when I worked with patients, then people would say, oh, you've left cognitive psychology for neuropsychology. And, and then there became cognitive neuroscience. And then everyone wanted to have, be a neuroscientist, so cognitive neuroscience, then effective, and so on. It's harmless for most purposes, but it can lead to problems in training. So if you're an effective neuroscience and you learn, learn about the emotion system, but you don't know anything about cognition, uh, that just doesn't fit the way children develop. The emotions and the cognitions are intertwined and not that they can't be separated for experimental purposes. They can be, but you have to know enough to understand that in fact, the attention networks that are developing in childhood can be predicted from some of the uh, affective responses that the child shows. And of course, same, similarly between cognitive and affective and social neuroscience. So uh, I think people have to get the training. Psychology has been a good vehicle name, overall name for the training that allows these disciplines to be seen together. I expect probably the psychology name will probably survive. People will still be doing MRI work with emotion and so on, and they may, and they also will hopefully influence work in neuroscience based on what is found out about the human brain. You've done teaching at all levels. Um, do you have any insights or thoughts about the teaching of psychology? That well, one of them I just said, I do think it's a unified enough discipline that it can be taught. Um, I really value teaching a lot. I got into the field primarily to teach. I really didn't expect to be a researcher, but you know, there were certain requirements and I was born, <laughs> I was born during the depression and making a living has always been a high priority in my mind. So uh, I did what I could uh, to do research. I, my feeling is the teacher has to take a person where they are and see if he can't somehow improve that person's knowledge or enthusiasm for whatever he's teaching. So uh, I am not a person who does a lot of selection. I, I, if someone approaches me and wants to learn something, and I think I could teach it to them, I, I'll try to do it. So I do think that uh, it's important to think about teaching in that way and to think about the field as a unified field. And I've had people come to Oregon from all over the world as postdocs and uh, have enjoyed very much in getting groups together where we could exchange ideas and, and they could learn and so on. And uh, it's really important to be able to put up with a quite a bit of criticism without folding. I remember when I got my first article rejected, I just told my wife, I just, I better not stay in this field. I can't. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's, you know, of course, now I know just about everyone gets, if the article says something, it's almost always rejected initially. <laughs> and. Uh, and you just have to learn to deal with that if you want to persist and, and succeed in psychology. And uh, in the groups that I directed, we, we always tried to provide pretty gentle criticism, but get people used to criticism. I always present it myself and hope 
people would get the idea that I, I, you know, I'd learn from being criticized too. And so I think there, there are a lot of things you can do to help make the group a, a, a strong instructional situation for graduate students and postdocs. I was just thinking about how I've been an indirect recipient of some of the spillover of some of these people who have come in who either have given me advice or helped me with genetics work, but also we just had a Spanish student come to my lab leaving about today, who is the student of Carmen, who was at working with you folks at least 10, 15 years ago. Uh, well, this is a, one of the amazing things about the field, and, and it's been really great for me. Uh, as I say, we had w w waves of postdocs who came from different parts of the world, and now, of course, not as a result of that, but as a result of the general globalization. Of course, psychology is a worldwide discipline. And uh, when I got into it, it was primarily an American discipline. The British were pretty strong and, uh, in many ways. And, uh, but the bulk of the work was done in the US or in the UK. There were course European laboratories but not not anywhere near like now now there still may be more American papers than other papers but the ideas if you look for ideas they might come from anywhere and uh, I think it is true it is a global discipline and that's really good for uh, the field and and uh, uh, it'll move things forward so what advice would you have for beginning as aspiring psychology students in terms of their training or futures? Well, uh, I think some of the things I said, uh, maybe it could be seen as advice, although probably my first advice would be be skeptical of all advice. But <laughs> uh, I do think that you do have to learn quite a bit of psychology. Uh, because if you just try to specialize too soon, too quickly, uh, you just don't know how, what aspects of one part of psychology will influence some other things. After all, it's one brain and mind in, any, in a given individual, and they influence each other. And so uh, I, I do think that's very important to get a good background. It's much more possible now because most of the graduate students in psychology come from psychology departments. Uh, you were mentioning that I got an undergraduate degree in physics. That, it wasn't unusual. Most of the people in the labs at Michigan didn't necessarily have psychology undergraduate degrees. They had had undergraduate degrees in engineering or physics or English or something. But now, of course, psychology is a huge discipline, so it, it provides most of the graduate students, and so most of the graduate students are pretty well have pretty strong backgrounds in psychology by the time they get to graduate school, and that really helps them move, move, move along through the program. I know you've been married to your wife for a very long time. Can you uh, tell us something about your wife and your children? Well, we were married in 1958. That is quite a while ago. <laughs> and uh, actually, um, She's right now attending her 60th high school reunion in Vancouver, British Columbia. And um, she uh, has had, uh, she did stay at home in the early part of, uh, of our child raising years. Uh, but when the children left and went off to various things, uh, she went into television. Uh, she first started off as an assistant, and then she was so good, uh, they asked her if she would do interviews on the local TV channel. And uh, she did do interviews, and she did do the news, and she was really locally pretty famous. Uh, I got a taste of what, it, well, definitely more than me. I got a taste of, of this while I was, you know, would bring her someplace, and people would be stopping, and you know, and so on. And uh, so she had career. However, although television brings a lot of fame, it doesn't bring very much money. <laughs> and, al and also, uh, she did early morning, so she had to get up at around six in the morning, which was okay with me, but she didn't like it too well. So um, 
when my opportunity to do imaging in St. Louis came along, I really wanted to do the task. And uh, she was quite willing to go. But uh, most of her friends thought this would, was a pretty sexist thing to do, move her away from her promising television career to go to St. Louis. And she didn't really get into uh, any broadcast work in St. Louis. Uh, she uh, went into pro producing videos, kind of like what we're doing here. So, uh, so she's done that. Uh, she did that since until we, we both retired. I, we have two children. Um, one of them is in the forest products business. He started off right out of high school uh, delivering firewood. He's now built a business which is, has about 170 employees. And so I guess in the terms of the modern political sim, he would be a job creator. <laughs> and, uh, and it's amazing to me to see some of the people that work for him and uh, the excitement they have in running that business. It has a strong retail element. His wife is a marketer. She's actually the president of the company. It's called Lane Forest Products. Our son is the vice president. And uh, they have a really wonderful company. And in a very different field, my younger son, Aaron, uh, he uh, is a theater director and now a playwright. He was uh, trained at Northwestern University where Frank Galati, who man who brought Grapes of Wrath to Broadway, he taught people to adapt literary works for the theater. And uh, Aaron uh, is now in Washington, D.C., and uh, he began adapting literary works, first with Haim Potok. He did uh, the books The Chosen and Osher Lev. And uh, then uh, he also did Ken Kesey's book, uh, Sometimes a Great Notion, made a great play in my opinion. And uh, right now he's uh, already done two adaptations of Chekhov's, uh, one of them uh, of the seagull, which he calls Stupid <laughs> Bird. <laughs> and uh, it's been very popular in the, in the uh, college scene. And the other one, Uncle Vanya, he calls Life Sucks. <laughs> so uh, they both have, and uh, they're, they're close friends, uh, very different fields, but uh, both have the same kind of personnel issues when you're directing theater as when you're running a forest product company, and so they have a lot in common. So it's been a really great experience for me to learn so much uh, from uh, these two wonderful adults. So what are some of the new activities you've gotten into in, you could call it retirement, though it isn't really in semi-retirement? <laughs> well, it's really retirement. My brother, I asked my brother, how do you know if you're working? And he said, <laughs> and he says, if they pay you, you're working. <laughs> and all my payment now comes from Social Security and other retirement schemes. So I am fully retired, but I can do what I like to do. Of course, I like to do psychology, and I have quite an active psychology uh, research program. But maybe it's a kind of, you know, genetics is a kind of correlation between the parents and the child. So maybe this is a reverse genetics. My son, Oren, went into the forest products business and I bought a forest. And uh, so preparing for retirement, I, I, in 1991, I bought a 60-acre forest seven miles in from the town where you have your home in Yahats. It's under a beautiful rock outcropping called Cape Perpetua, one of the most beautiful places in the world. And uh, I do quite a bit of forestry work there. Mostly it's conservation work. Mostly it's planting uh, along our river. We have about a mile of river. According to biological theory, maybe not to be taken mo any more seriously than psychological theory, uh, they think the salmon will come back when we get enough trees planted to cool the river down. Plus, 
we have a good beaver population. Now, they do bad things to me, they take my trees down, but they do good things for the salmon because that wood makes the kind of little back currents that the little salmon can shelter. So I'm uh, actively involved in the forestry area. We go there practically every weekend and uh, spend time. And uh, we have a dwelling, a yurt. A lovely yurt it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, why don't we finish up with uh, you are telling us something about your current psychological interests. Yes, I would like to tell you about that. Uh, I'm doing my first animal research since I was a, just got my undergraduate degree and tried biophysics. And uh, so that's about 60 years ago. And the reason I'm doing this animal research is because in our work with training humans, we found changes in white matter pathways using diffusion tensor imaging, a version of MRI. And uh, I wanted to know why, how could this white matter be changed by various kinds of training? And of course, we're not the only ones who found white matter changes with various kinds of training. And uh, I came up with a hypothesis and uh, it suggested that it might be the frontal theta that's produced by the meditation. And with, through colleagues in the biology department, I have um, set up some experiments with mice in which we're imposing frontal theta using a technique called optogenetics with laser light. And uh, then we hope to see whether we get changes in the white matter pathways, which can be assayed with elect electron microscopy. So it's a very different field. I mean, it's an outgrowth, but it clearly comes from the work that we've been doing. We're going ahead with our training work in humans, as well as this mice work. So uh, that's my main current psychology, kind of looking forward. But I'm also looking backward uh, to the 2,500 year history of work on attention. I, I was approached by a publishing company and they wanted four volumes of classic papers in the area of attention. And uh, so I consulted with about 40 other attention researchers and with their help, I've tried to choose papers over this long period of time going all the way back to the Hindu holy books, which turn out to be very relevant to current work in uh, using meditation to change uh, brain activity and so on. And uh, so going back 2,500 years and then at first very sparsely having papers like by people like Descartes and um, a lot of other uh, philosophical works, and then going through some of the early methodologies that were developed for example, Stroop's own paper on the Stroop effect, and, uh, and then up to the current time. So I've been looking backward to get the history, and I think that's been helpful in shaping the kind of research that I'm, I'm doing looking forward. I remember having breakfast with you, and you were thinking about how would you submit a grant to, say, NIH about mice meditation? <laughs> 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 How do you package that? <laughs> yes, we, we didn't. I wouldn't have submitted a grant to NIH. I do think they would be rather critical of this idea. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the idea is not so far uh, so fanciful because we're not requiring the mice to meditate. We're simply imposing this theta rhythm, which is a result of various kinds of training, of which meditation is one. Yeah. Well, um, are there any other new directions you're taking in uh, uh, well, I, the I have like another, with Mary? Well, I, I have another grant application in, uh, other than these two psychological grants I've been talking about, and that's for riparian restoration. So uh, I have been planting trees uh, along the river, and now there's a, a, a conservation group that wants to facilitate 
even more tree planting. And they have some new ideas about how to protect the trees from the beaver. I think the beaver will have better ideas and we'll still, <laughs> and we'll still get at the trees. But uh, I'm hopeful that this will make our forest even more attractive, at least to us and maybe to the salmon as well. Well, thank you, Mike, for sharing your history, thoughts, and insights with us today. You're very welcome. <laughs>